Hey guys, all right, so we officially made it to the last trading day of the year. Uh, today was quarterly option expiration. So I didn't, I don't think I really made any videos this week. I just didn't have time, just been a busy week. Kids have been home from school. So uh, this is gonna be a longer video, just as you get, so you guys know as ahead of time. I'm going to talk about uh, basically what's going forward in 2024, kind of where I think markets could go, uh, and then more or less just kind of talk about some big macroeconomic things and then we'll kind of get into the daily and weekly TA here. So first thing to talk about is the JPM collar that did roll today. So officially JPM is short 50, 15 calls. They are long 45, 10 puts and short 3,800 puts. So essentially, you know, again, I want to be very clear. JPM does not play the collar as a directional play. It is strictly a hedge. It is only intended to essentially hedge against their longer term plays. Um, JPM makes the most money the closer we are to the puts. So those 45, 10 puts. Uh, and they lose the most money the further we're over the short 50-15 calls. So for instance, this quarter, um, when they, we were well over their sold, um, sold calls, which were 45-15, so we are almost 250 points over that. Um, essentially, I calculated at one time, it was about a billion dollars in loss. However, keep in mind, this is a head. So, you know, JPM has all the other assets, which with markets at all time highs, I can almost guarantee those assets are doing just fine. So something to keep in mind here, uh, interestingly enough, is that this is officially the only the second time since, um, was he? sorry, I'm trying to pull this out here. Since 1985, that SPY and the NASDAQ has had nine green weeks in a row. So a very, very long win streak. Um, and that win streak was about 11 green in a row. So we'll see uh, if we can keep that up or not here. I thought something was interesting I saw was the average forecast for 2023 end of year was about 4,000. And this is coming from all the big money analysis. Uh, 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 analysts out there. Um, so they were off by almost 20%. So that's pretty, pretty interesting. Um, some of the biggest winners of 2023 was uh, NVIDIA was up 236%. Meta was up 196%. Um, AMD 122%. Tesla 113%. Um, the biggest winner sector wise was uh, actually semiconductors. Now, the biggest loser of S&P, uh, biggest change to the downside was FMC Corp, uh, Emphase Energy, and surprisingly Dow Generals on there, but Moderna and Pfizer. So looking at the average forecast going forward for 2024, majority of uh, analysts are calling for somewhere between 5,000 and 5,200. I would put the average right about 5,000. Uh, so that's a pretty good amount of upside here. So, you know, that's 250 point points here. Uh, that's a sizable rally. Now, interestingly enough, if they undercut the upside once again by 20%, that could put us about 5,800. Now, my prediction going forward, and this is based off, and I put this in the in the in the written TA. So if you want to see the picture, uh, I already got rid of it on my screen because it would be too cluttered to show that and do my weekly TA here. But um, there's a bull channel that's on the weekly time frame that gives me, if we continue in it, and this has basically been a bull channel since about uh, mid 2023, or sorry, 2022. Uh, we could be somewhere between 500 to about uh, 690 area on, or sorry, 520 area on uh, SPY. There's also a bigger, broader bull channel that this one actually dates back to uh, 2018. Uh, and it uses the COVID lows. If we hold that channel, our upside uh, is about 460 to about 630. So... I really do think that we, I think we could see 500 either way, 
But by end of year, where we're actually going to close, my prediction is somewhere between 500 and 570. So that's about a 20% upside, which what I think is even more interesting about this is if you look at this the historical average here. So on average, the years that the S&P 500 has had a 10% or more gain in the final two months, so this is November and December, on average, they are pushing about 19.5% total gain the next year. So that would put us a right about that 20% mark I was talking about. Another interesting metric here is that we're heading into a presidential election. So this, uh, you know, it, it is what it is. I don't really care about anything else besides it's a presidential election year. Uh, in election years uh, and pre-election years, we are seeing on average a 20 to 22 percent gain pre-election year that means you know that's right in line with that 20 percent that i was talking about so i think there's quite a bit of metrics that support a 20 percent potential upside um on spy now again do i think it's just going to go straight up 20 percent over a year no it'll be choppy it'll be wild it'll be interesting uh, I do think, and I'll get to it once we get to the TA uh, actually over here, uh, I do think we could see a big correction at some point, but I do think likely we're going to see some upside. Uh, I found it interesting that the 30-year mortgage rate is now down to 6.6%. Um, this is actually the ninth straight week of drops in the 30-year mortgage rate. That is the most and the largest decline since November 2008 to January 2009, which we all know what happens back that happened back then. Uh, we are actually kind of historically coming into our average though, um, that kind of you know four to five percent area. So we're about two two you know two percent away from that. So you know historically, I would say five to six percent is pretty average for a mortgage rate if you look back to 2000. Uh, and you know, that's kind of where we're heading right now. So we could taper off in that area. I wouldn't be surprised to kind of see that. So we're going to talk about a couple of ma uh, macroeconomic things to look forward to, to think about as we go forward. Uh, the first one is really unemployment claims, jobless claims. You know, we've kind of been holding steady in this 200 to 300 K area. Uh, and I think the big thing to watch is that, you know, we're, we're playing out this soft landing narrative right now. We're playing out this narrative that, you know, the economy is going to stay strong and the Fed is going to basically pause where they're at and eventually pivot cut rates and the economy is going to stay strong and markets are going to keep rallying and inflation is going to go down to 2%. That is currently the narrative that the market wants to believe and that the Fed wants to believe too. Now, I think that we need to see jobs hold steady in that negative in that 200 to 300k area. I think if we spike over 300k, that shows that there is a potential uh, big drop in unemployment coming, which could, um, sorry, by a big drop, I mean increase unemployment rate, as in there's more people losing their jobs, which could mean the economy is weakening. However, if we drop under really 200k then that could show the economy is almost too strong. And when the economy is strong, remember inflation goes up generally because people are buying. Now, the big thing obviously next is unemployment rate. Realistically, the average rate since about 2022 was 3.5 to 3.7%. And we've really held steady there for two, two years now. Now the soft landing narrative, we would hold steady in this area here. Um, I do think the biggest thing to watch for is a spike to greater than 4% or less than 3.4%, which is the two year low and basically the two year high. Um, as long as we kind of hold in the middle here, I think we're on the right path. Uh, and then this is a big thing right here is the FOMOC meetings. Now again, remember really through all of 2023, the Fed held steady to the fact that they were not going to cut rates in 2024. They held steady to inflation was not defeated. They had more to go, um, blah, 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 blah. However, this last December FOMOC meeting was a huge, huge pivot, if you would, for the Fed. You know, they finally changed to the narrative that, yeah, we are going to cut rates. Yes, we might have finally put inflation on the right path. With them saying that and them doing that, the market, of course, took off like running like crazy. 
realistically, the Fed's expected end of year 2024 Fed's rate is 4.5 to 4.75%. Right now, the market has the highest odds of about 3.5 to 3.75 and pretty close to 3.75 to 4. So essentially, the market is pricing in over double what the Fed says they've, they are expecting. So this honestly is the narrative that I think has the most impact on 2024. Now, if the Fed can tame inflation and they can indeed bring it down and they can do the cuts that the market expects, I really think the soft landing narrative could play out. I think we could get the, you know, I think it was like the 70s or 80s where Fed cut rates and we rallied. I think that's possible. However, and we're going to talk about CPI next, if CPI goes back up or more importantly, if it plateaus and the Fed holds higher for longer, or if we get a surprise rate hike because inflation really rebounds, that is where potential number one black swan event comes. I think if feds basically hold steady to the three cuts, or if they even pull back from that and they go with no cuts for some crazy reason, in 2024, markets are going to have a choice. Their only choice is going to be, do we believe the fed or do we not believe the Fed? Do they think the Fed's wrong or do they realize that they've been wrong since December, or really November when they started pricing in more rate cuts? That is gonna be a really, really, really interesting metric to watch. Um, something interesting I saw was that typically after the first uh, Fed cut, market rides, rises. Now, generally speaking, it's only about a 5% rise, um, but what I thought was really interesting is the fact that once um, we get to about that third rate cut, that is when the market really breaks or doesn't break. Generally speaking, if we're not in a recession, market actually rallies off of the third cut. Now, when we are in a recession, we don't even make it to the third cut sometimes before we have the big one. And generally speaking, when we are in the recession and the Fed's cuts, that's when we have the biggest potential for the market crash. So let's go over to CPI here. Now, if we look at CPI, realistically, since our peak in July 2022, we've been steadily decreasing, basically a straight line drop. We had one small rebound from uh, July 2023 to October 2023, where we had a 2.9 to a 3.8% rebound. Uh, but after that, we you know pretty much peaked at 3.8%, and we have been coming down steadily to our current low of 3.1%. Now, it is extremely important to get to that 2% goal the Fed has. Now, we're only about 1.1% away from that, but based on how slow now that inflation is unwinding, you know, we're about six months away from that. So best case scenario to see 2%, uh, it could be about, uh, you know, June, uh, May to June area there. So now... This is where I think the first hiccup could come. And this is, again, potential number two for the black swan, which goes with the first one, which is the, the Fed uh, and FOMOC, is that if inflation for some reason stays here at 3% and it just can't break lower and it just can't get to the, the at least to the twos, I would say, markets are not going to like that. The Fed, in my opinion, will not cut rates unless inflation is in the twos. They will need to see clear, continuous unwinding of inflation uh, in order to have that first rate cut, which according to the Fed, I would say projected wise is about July, which lines up pretty perfectly with 2% inflation by July. Now, market wants to believe that we'll have the first rate cut potentially in January, but most likely in March. So... That's gonna be very, very interesting to watch. Now go over to core inflation. We're kind of in the same metric here. You know, um, we had our, our, our peak in early 2022. Now the big difference here is that core was extremely sticky in the 5.5 to 5.7 range from December, 2022 to April, 2023, when it finally broke. Uh, and then since then, we've pretty much steadily been un unwinding on, on uh, CPI or CPI core um, year over year now. Now, the one thing is that core 
is actually plateauing at back-to-back -back months stuck at 4%. Now again, we get uh, our next CPI reading, I wanna say is January 11th. Uh, it's right around that time period though, about two weeks out. Um, if core drops into the threes and year over year drops into the twos, I think we're gonna go on a, a massive rally into FOMOC, which likely FOMOC Fed will probably pause still, but we'll give the bearish, you know, basically the, the go ahead that we are gonna cut eventually probably next meeting or the meeting after that. However, if core year over year bounces even to 4.1%, but especially to 4.2%, and if year over year CPI bounces anywhere back up and higher than where it's currently at, I think that starts our correction. I think markets are gonna get scared that inflation is gonna rebound, much like what happened back in October, uh, sorry, in July, where we had a big correction, if you remember. I think that's what's gonna happen. So those are the biggest things I wanna watch. Uh, so I wanna go over to the dollar index here. Um, this is something I'm gonna start watching uh, is the dollar index. So if you look, our peak here was in October, 2022 of the dollar. What happened in October, 2022, you ask? Well, that was the trough, the bottom of the market. And you see the dollar just unwound basically until right about here in July of 2023. And what happened in July of 2023? Well, the markets had a top, a temporary top before they went into a huge correction to the downside. Now the dollar, as you see, bounced off of those levels. And then when did it stop with its rally to the upside officially on the weekly time frame? Well, you can see here, that was the week of Halloween. What happened the week of Halloween? That was the bottom of the rally that SPY and the Qs and the market in general is currently in. I think the way this narrative is playing out here, and you can see this massive doji reversal candle here on the dollar, if the dollar starts to break out, so we are gonna be looking at, you know, um, I don't even know where my drawler is here, there it is. So if we're looking at a move up this way like that, I think that is the ugliest <laughs> arrow I've ever seen. I think we're gonna get a big old breakout here. Now, big level to watch is 104 uh, on the dollar and 106. If we get over those levels, that's certainly gonna be, uh, I think, the start of the downside. So I am really gonna start watching the dollar. I'm gonna watch it on the weekly time frame because I think the daily was too noisy. I watched this earlier in the year. Um, it was really about this time period where it was just kind of doing nothing and I really found it to be noise, but in the macro accent um, um, Aspect here it is huge and it is very telling now if we break this overall bear channel here From the dollar which this correlates pretty much with a macro bear, bull channel on the markets Then we might be looking at the bigger crash here or correction at least. Now let's go over to the 10 year yield here. Same thing, let's kind of take it back here. So we got April, 2023. You know, what did we do come, you know, spring into really fall? Well, we had a huge rally in the markets. Now we did have a little dip in July where you got this right here. Right here. And there was a time period here where yields really didn't make a whole lot of sense in my opinion. Uh, and they really weren't just kind of tracking with how you would expect them to with the markets, but same thing here, when did the yields peak? Yields peaked the week before Halloween. And what happened, of course, the week of Halloween? That was the bottom of the market. So as you can see here, we have a huge rejection and now the yields are coming back down. This really 3.37 to 3.8 area is massive consolidation. You can see this, this is October, 2022, where we peaked and came down. And then we had our little bounces here. You know, this is peak area of support. If much like, as you see here on the dollar, we have that doji candle. If we get our doji and this is our bottom and we start to turn up and break this down channel here on the on the 10 year yield. So likely we would need to be somewhere probably back up in the fours. That could give us that early signal that the bigger correction in the market is coming. As long as the 10 year is going down and the dollar is going down, I like upside in the market. As soon as we start to see that trend flip, I like it. To, I like the downside. Now we're gonna go over to oil here. And again, I'm not always gonna to touch on oil. I just wanted to touch on it because it's end of year, kind of if anybody that trades it, watches it and wants to see it. Uh, kind of same thing here though. So June, 2022, and this really goes into the inflation narrative more than it goes into really just markets in general. But June, 2022, we have our peak here. 
when did inflation peak? July. Now what happened? We unwound all the way down here to June 2023. And then we had a bounce in oil into September. Now when did we have our, um, our rebound in inflation? Well, it was July through September or through October actually. So perfectly correlated with this huge bounce here. So kind of same thing here. We have this unwinding here. We're coming into historical, really going back to, if you zoom out here, all the way back to 2021 here, this, um, you know, 66.7 to 71 area is critical support. If oil holds in this weekly level and we get a breakout and we start going back up to our bear channel right here, that is going to take inflation up with it. What happens when inflation goes up? Markets does not like that. And that's all going to be potential for our correction. So again, same thing here. I want to watch and I'm going to watch it on a weekly time frame. Oil, I want to watch the dollar and I want to watch the 10 year. I like the VIX and I'm going to get to the VIX later about why I'm going to put less, less weight into it going into 2024, but it is something to watch. Just for kind of fun here, Bitcoin, I don't really talk about Bitcoin much. I used to talk about it a lot, but I don't really talk about it much anymore. Uh, we got a really nice weekly bull flag that's playing out here. Uh, we do have a weekly demand. I don't know what happened to it, but it's right here. So really, we had a nice little bull fly playing out here. The halving is coming in 2024, April. So likely we could get a rally into that. So I believe the last one was in April 2022. So we can kind of just go back and look at our, sorry, 2020 um, when that was. So let's see. Yeah, so kind of same thing. You can see we rallied 2019 into it. Kind of early 2020, we had that rally just like we're right now. Then again, COVID happened, so things are a little different. But look at this. After the happening, and really, again, this was also because we went into a bull market, got out of COVID, just that massive rally. So I'm going to be curious to kind of watch Bitcoin. Um, there used to be a pretty big correlation with it, but this bull flag could play out to the upside with a target of really 47K and 51K. I would say if we lose 41.3K, likely we're coming back down into the 30s. All right, now let's go back over to SPY. Let's get into it here. We're going to talk on the weekly time frame or the daily and weekly real quick here. Kind of be brief. I know my video is getting long. I really thought it was important to cover all this stuff for you guys here. So on a daily time frame here, you can see we're pushing up. We got a double supply now really at 476.77 to 478.11. And along with that, we have a double demand support area here from 469.29 to 471.25. This, in my opinion, is our consolidation range. This reminds me a lot of this consolidation, and it reminds me a lot of this consolidation down here. So again, consolidation is not necessarily bearish. And even today, because we are in extreme daily bull momentum, where did our, our drop bounce off of? It bounced directly off the AEMA. Now, if we get a bounce like we did on December 21st, we could be looking at a push up here in the next week. I would be very, very hesitant to be bearish until we close under at least 469.2, which should be the daily 20 EMA and would be our double demand. If we have a bigger breakdown into early 2024, which I really do think markets have set us up nicely for an early 2024 correction, I would be targeting at the 454 area. Going over to the SPY here on the weekly, you can see same thing, nice breakout here. We have a really strong support area though at 459.4. So again, I would be tough pressed to be bearish until we're under this area, but this 476.28, that's the, the all-time high supply area. And you can see we couldn't quite get it. Now, back-to-back -back dojis here. And one critical thing that is the first time it's happened since the start of this rally, back here the week of Halloween, is that we had weekly buyers slow and weaken. We have not seen that happen since this rally started. This is the first sign that the potential for the top to be in is here. Now, again, I think that extreme weekly momentum likely would bounce this off the weekly eight EMA, which projected would be right about 466 area uh, going into next week. 
Going over to ES here, same thing. Now ES, you know, we don't have the double de demand and double supply, but what we do have is a really nice triple top off 48.35 and a really nice double bottom off 47.50. Effectively, this is our range, which again, much like back here in November and early December, I believe we are consolidating. Same thing, we are still in extreme bull momentum, but again, buyers continue to weaken on the daily and you know, really only, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Only two of the last 10 trading days did buyers come in to support price. The last really supported price was back here at um, our close of 47.69. So same thing on SPY really last, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Of the last 11 trading days, only three of those were supported. And the most recent closed supported price would be 470.5 uh, on SPY. So again, you know, I, I expect downside, but I think it is only just a temporary drop. Futures weekly here, same thing. We got the doji weekly reversal. Now, again, if you remember on the dollar and the 10 year, and even on oil, you saw those potential inverse doji candles. If that plays out and we get that pop up on yields and the dollar next week, that likely could bring down markets with that. So markets are correlated right there. That's where I wanna start watching that a little bit more frequently. Now let's go over to the cues here. Um, on the queues here, this is a little bit different setup. So we got a new supply on Wednesday at 411.52. As you can see, we broke our bull channel. Now we did an extreme bull momentum, bounce off the daily eight EMA support. But same thing here, we do not have uh, buyers to support further upside. We really haven't had buyers come in since back in this area. So again, I would still be hesitant to be long-term bearish and so realistically, we closed under 403.24. Going over to the weekly time frame, same thing. Now, uh, we did again, we have our Dogely weekly candle put in here. Buyers did slow and weaken for the first time since the October rally started. So this opens up that potential for a bigger crack or a bigger correction here. Now, same thing. If you look at this, what do you see? The weekly 20 EMA support is trending with this bull channel. So we could get a bigger correction even down to really the four, 390s probably and still be in our bull channel and still use that as a potential bounce to go higher. Going over to NQ here. So we are still in our bull channel. It's a little bit wider here because we had much more consolidate, a bigger, just wider consolidation uh, just because of after hours. Now, same thing, we came down, we did back test 16,955 demand and the daily eight EMA support and we hard bounced off it, which is not surprising because again, we're an extreme daily bull momentum. Now again, same thing, we did not have buyers come in to support further upside. So I really am looking for a little bit bigger of a drop here. Now into really, let's call it Wednesday, remember markets are closed on Monday. We could see a drop down to this double demand at 16,787 area and still be in our bull channel and still be over the daily 20 EMA support, which could bounce us back to the upside even more and even stronger. Weekly wise, same thing. So, you know, we actually got a weekly supply at 16,964, technically an imbalance close with a doji here. So realistically, I'm looking for a drop to the downside. So just barely, ever so slightly on the the weekly here for NQ, it's the only one that did have buyers to support further upside. So, you know, I think that's going to weaken next week. I think we will see those buyers weaken. And I would not be surprised to see a pretty good, you know, correction to the downside. I think a weekly AEMA support test, which probably be somewhere around 16,594 is highly probable. Now let's look at the VIX. So I've been saying it since probably, I think back in this area in November that the VIX just, just hasn't been doing it. You know, we've had, and again, today was one of those days where you have the VIX closing red and markets closing red. Now, again, of course, it's not a perfect correlation. There's going to be outliers where we get, you know, a green VIX day, green market day, a red VIX day, red market day. Uh, and really in 2022, we started to see that it was also end of year. 
And, you know, I chalked it up to, well, we were dropping and VIX was dropped, or it was early, more mid, sorry, mid to early 2022. Uh, you know, VIX was dropping and markets were dropping. And I just kind of um, basically said, well, you know what? Markets just agree that we should be dropping. So volatility, of course, is going to come down because everybody just agrees we're bearish. However, right now i i really don't think that's what the case is you know and again i'm not somebody to say manipulation i'm not here to say that big money is out to get us little retail traders but i do think there's some vix suppression going on you don't have this many spikes on the vix or even this the biggest spike since the pre-rally essentially back in uh, october to then just get sold off and really have markets do nothing you know, there's just too much movement on the VIX uh, in an odd way to not have some sort of outside force on it. And again, the market manipulation of the VIX is actually a well-documented uh, thing. Um, if you look up articles about it, you can Google it. There is quite a few articles about big hedge funds that used to, and I don't know if they changed how it works where they can still do it or not, but these big money funds, what they would do is they would just queue, let's say, I don't know, I'm going to throw out a random number, 100,000 calls on the VIX. And when they do that, just because they are queuing them and like just putting them in their cart or cart G's, putting them in like their uh, orders ready to execute them, apparently the way the, 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 um, exchanges work that triggers something where they actually take that as a real order because it has to basically i guess prepare for that order but what they do is instead of executing that order and sending it through they just cancel it out so essentially the the exchanges start to react to that order and then it never happens so then you get these weird wild moves on the vix so you know if you think about it if you don't want markets to go on a correction you know what's the best way to do that well suppress the vix for one so we'll kind of see how that plays out. And I, I've, I mean, I've really seen it intraday, even today, you know, that we had that big, you know, 150 point drop on NQ. Um, and then we just kind of slow recovered. And really that whole recovery, the whole time markets tried to drop back down. You know, there was so many times and I think I have it up here. Let's see. Nope, I'm on a different date. Hold on. So there was so many times in this rally here. If I can find markets, there we go. So there was so many times after this drop, especially right around this time period right here. And this is a, uh, you know, 2.30 PM where I was expecting and I played this upside move to the 20 EMAs here. But in my opinion, when we got this double top, and we rejected hard, as you can see with that wick off the 20 EMA, we should have came back down. And the whole time we didn't even have buyers or really technicals to support further upside. So then we pushed up and once again here, uh, we had one, two, three, really four doji potential reversal to the downside candles. Yet you see we pushed up before we just kind of slowly with some weird dojis bounce back up. This candle right here specifically at 2.30 I thought was very odd. You know, we had this push up here and then we get three basically reversal topping dojis, which I would say 99% of the time this plays out for a drop back to the downside or if inverse this was, you know, to the downside, we would pop to the upside. But then you get this candle that opens and out of nowhere basically just straight from open pumps right back up now the collar did roll right around here about 115 uh 112 was the official time so likely this these three candles was that collar roll happening but you know again there's just been so much in this market lately where especially to the downside it just everything says downside and yet we still find a way to rally so i'm really curious now that the collar is rolled um, now that we're going to get out of this low volume, choppy holiday trading, I am really, really curious if we are going to get some sizable moves for one, you know, none of this kind of choppy 30 to 40% average range, if we're going to get some solid moves and if they are finally going to let this market do whatever it wants to do, we'll find out, but I hope you guys had a good year of trading. It was a good year, you know. For anybody that's been following me for any sort of significant time, had a really great 2022. 
Um, obviously, 2022, I had some struggles too with um, trading. You know, part of obviously real trading, you're going to struggle. Anybody that tells you they don't struggle and win 100% of the time is lying to you. Uh, but, you know, I really struggled summer um, of 2023 here. Uh, options just, and a lot of it, I believe, has to do with the VIX um, and a couple other metrics that just don't make sense anymore. But I just really saw such a wild just move in the markets and such a change in the markets that I, my option strategy just basically died. So I was basically left with two choices, either keep trading options and, you know, suffer and potentially figure it out or not. Um, but what I decided to do is switch over to futures. Um, and I'm really, really glad I did. It was a hard transition, um, you know, learning to go basically from options to futures. It's a different world. It's a different strategy. It moves differently. Uh, and initially when I started trading futures for probably about two months, I think it was, I was trying to scalp. So when I was a, an options trader, I scalped. That's what I did primarily. You know, I'm in and out a couple minutes, you know, quick 10, 20%, whatever it was, you know, in and out fast, good to go. Um, which is great with options because, you know, if you get the premiums to move and, you know, you time it just right, you're going to get rewarded greatly. But the biggest issue was, you know, with, with futures because it doesn't matter if you get that pop if it's not the right amount of points. And the biggest thing I had to learn with futures is how to deal with drawdown. So, you know, I would a lot of times I would scalp and I would sometimes have like an 80, 90 percent win rate. But then I would get that one trade that stops me out. And because my gains were so low, it would get I would get back all my all my wins. So essentially this last week here, you know, I was kind of frustrated early week with this choppy market. Um, and, you know, looking back at my trading, I know that if I were to let my plays run, the winners run, and then, you know, let the losers stop out at 10 points, like I do on NQ, that my profits should be way higher. So I kind of did some analysis this week, and what I learned uh, was pretty cool. So basically what I learned was that when I enter a trade, um, and I would not include this week just because it's low volume and kind of choppy with OPEX. So I, outside of this week trading, um, of my winning trade, so trades, and this is, actual live entries, real entries, like looking at the chart to see where it would have gone, not like a predictive entry based off of like a strategy, but like what I actually traded. All but 2% of the 2 to 3% of the time, those trades I enter would hit 10 points of profit before stop lossing out. Now, the big difference is, you know, where I on average closed out my trades was only for 5 points of profit. So again, obviously if I'm only trading five points of profit on average and my stop loss is 10 points, gotta have a pretty high win rate to win. So, you know, I was looking through my trade. On average, my winning trade generally went on to be about 28 points. So I basically come up with a new bracket. I have two different brackets. My first bracket is kind of the let it run bracket. So essentially, once it hits 10 points, it gives me a one point auto break even, uh, and then the goal is to hit 15 points and then it starts to trail five points from there. So the goal is a bigger win. Um, my second bracket is basically a 10 point take profit and a 10 point stop loss. Now today or yesterday I traded this, um, it was great. I basically had two 10 point wins. Um, I had one that should have been a 10 point win. It hit it, it hit it, but again, I let it hit the break even and it stopped me out at break even. So yesterday was a great day using that. Today, I had a 10 point, or my first trade of the day, um, I only saw about seven to eight points. I liked it, I liked the upside, and I held, and it ended up stopping me out my negative 10 points, not a big deal. Um, second trade of the day, same thing. Uh, I actually switched over from my 10 point take profit to the 10 point trigger one. Um, so I did hit 10 points, so it triggered my one point break even. But then of course it came back up, hit my one point and then dropped down about 20 points, which would have been a nice win. And then my third point of the trade of the day, which was when I traded this breakout right here, I took 10 points uh, and actually I was targeting right here pretty much exactly at the 17, um, 0, 15 area. And I was trying to move, I entered right about here on this opening candle here. And I was trying to get my break, my break or my take profit from 10 points moved up to about 20 points, but I just couldn't do it fast enough. Uh, and it took me out at 10 points. So 
I like the strategy. You know, I had a flat, basically a flat day today, but um, I like the strategy. So I'm going to probably stick with for a little while the 10 point take profit and the 10 point stop loss. Uh, and again, you know, my win rate, generally speaking, is always 60 to 70 percent. So if I can make my wins hold and my losses, you know, you know, when I don't need them or whatnot. Um, and the biggest thing for me is just letting those winners run. And this is even with options. I always had that problem, too, is just being comfortable that, you know, sometimes you might get stopped out like my first trade. Um, but most of the time, you know, it's going to hit your profit if I have a target. Let it run to the target. There's no reason to close it out early. Um, so going forward, you know, 2024, I'm pretty excited for trading 2024. Uh, I'm glad I got my strategy figured out. I'm glad I'm on a good path here. Um, again, you know, I'm not upset about having drawdown in this year. Um, I learned a lot from the market. A lot, I learned a lot from other people. Um, a lot of things that are going to benefit me going into 2024 and the last two months I really had a great two months of profits and a great two months of trading uh, And I'm going to take the energy into 2024 and just continue to trade my strategy and you know Regardless of what the market gives me. I don't really care if market goes to 6,000 or if it goes to 3,000 as long as we have solid technicals intraday to trade it's tradable. It doesn't matter what the macro is, as long as you what the inside is happening makes sense. So overall, you know, one thing I would say to end this for you guys and for 2024 is that the key to success is not taking big profits. It is not hitting home run after home run. It is small, consistent gains, small base hits. But the number one most important thing that keeps you profitable is proper risk management. The whole reason I'm even having a green year this year is because of my risk management. Even in my worst of times when I was trading options and I had like a 40% win rate one rate week when it was really in the in the bad, you know, I never gave up that much profits. I always just kind of stayed flat and I started slowly building back on those profits here end of the year. So, you know, if you can keep your losses small and keep your win, wins consistent and big, you will always over time be profitable. You know, there's going to be people on Twitter that show you that they made a million dollars or, well, I only made $10,000 today or I only made $100,000 this month or whatever they like to tell you. But don't, don't let that noise bother you. Don't let that convince you that you need to trade more aggressively or you need to change your strategy, you know half those people are lying for one and for two you don't have that capital or you do but even if you have that capital <clears throat> there's no reason to force trades and force gains like that trade what's in front of you trade smart preserve capital it's a marathon it's not a sprint all right guys i hope you guys have a great new year and i will see you guys next year